My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. so much. Thank you, Vance. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, what is going to be the future of oil and gas in an increasingly digital world? Uh, this technology, your technology, paints a very exciting and teasing future, but the industry does need to embrace some very difficult changes that I'm going to lay out in front of us this morning. Before we go any further, uh, may I politely remind you that we are holding this gathering on the traditional lands of the Nitsitapi people and their three great nations, which are the Tsutina, the Stony Nakoda, and the Siksika. And it's important that we extend our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. And I encourage all of you to do this this morning. Now, by way of introduction, I'm obligated to tell you that I am a retired senior consulting partner from Deloitte an obligation imposed by my former firm. And uh, you probably have two immediate reactions to this. How can someone so young be retired? <laughs> and you'd be right, I'm not retired. Uh, according to Deloitte, uh, partners have to retire for tax reasons, and um, which I don't really understand. Um, there are so many other better terms to describe someone who leaves professional services. Um, withdrawn, traded, um, graduated, discharged, and my personal favorite, paroled. <laughs> but whatever the term, I've continued to pursue my personal passion, which is uh, the impacts of digital innovation on the oil and gas industry. And to, uh, to that uh, end, I have published this, uh, this first book, which is creatively titled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas. It's been in the works for two years. And it sets out my vision for the oil and gas industry uh, if the Jetsons were in charge and not the NDP. Now, secondly, I find the label senior, um, how to put this politely, ageist. Um, and of course, once your hair turns white, like mine does, although I shave it off now, um, the only conclusion people reach is that you must be a senior citizen. Well, I prefer other senior terms like senior debt. Um, senior class and the ever popular senior vice president. Um, by the way, the little micro advertisement that I am available to alternative roles to retirement. Now, over my 32 year career with uh, the oil and gas industry, I've been through many an oil and gas downturn, but only one other uh, industrial relocation uh, that was enabled by extensive new computerization, which was the adoption of SAP uh, in the late 1990s. And um, I'm sure we all have our views about how successful that effort was. And I know what you're thinking. Excel spreadsheets have also transformed the industry, but I'd like to remind you, not for the better. We're now at the stages of what could be another transformation for the uh, industry, a transformational change. And the impacts of digital on many other industries uh, are now both um, uh, plain, pivotal, and for many, quite painful. In my view, the orthodoxies that have guided our thinking for years uh, in North American oil and gas are now the patterns of thinking that may block our ability to make the maximum of this new technology. So what exactly are these, oil, uh, these orthodoxies? <clears throat> the oil and gas industry runs on what I call an, a generally set of accepted rules that have guided decision making for decades. No one really challenges them or, or uh, 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 disputes them because they've worked so reliably and they've served us so well. For example, I'll give you an idea of what an orthodoxy is. Um, I um, have, uh, those of you with young children, as your children are growing up, you give them two rules of life. Number one, you don't talk to strangers. And number two, you don't get in strangers' cars. Now my children call up a complete stranger and get in their car, and they call that Uber. And an orthodoxy that changed almost overnight. There are three typical orthodoxies about the oil and gas industry that have guided us for decades. Number one, data is proprietary. Oil and gas believes that its data is proprietary and it, it must remain inside the firewall, be highly protected and very secure. And data is recorded as an operating cost. 
which minimizes the amount of capital allocated to it at times. And of course, at one time, collecting and storing data was indeed an expensive proposition. It was scarce, and therefore it's, it was perceived uh, that it needed to be protected and, uh, and, and it had occurred this operating cost. That cost created value, and indeed we still sell our subsurface data at multiples of its collection cost. But as an oil and gas industry, we are blessed with copious holdings of data, and we generate prodigious amounts of it every hour. But only the biggest firms can really afford to analyze all of that data. We therefore over understate its monetary value, we overstate its sensitivity, and we hold very dear to the idea that only humans in, and industry insiders can make sense of it all. Orthodoxy number one. Orthodoxy number two. Some metal is, uh, our metal is dumb. Some metal is pretty smart though. It's been connected to uh, SCADA systems like pump, pumps and valves and other installations dating back to, to the 80s. But most metal is pretty dumb still. 80%, 85% of it is unconnected to anything. The oil and gas industry though practically invented, although we don't take as much credit for it as we should, the industry practically invented smart devices, smart metal, remote monitoring and connectivity. SCADA began because of the oil and gas industry. But SCADA is expensive, and retrofitting metal to SCADA systems can be prohibitively expensive, and indeed many SCADA systems are just walled gardens whose intent is to keep out uh, innovations and third-party solutions. And in fact, once installed, sometimes SCADA systems are viewed by their inventors as a way to guarantee a return forever. Adding new digital sensors to these prohibitively costly systems uh, is sometimes a victim of a management of change process. It deemed to be too risky because of cyber concerns or too uncertain given their novelty. And so as a consequence, the industry tends to slow walk some of these adoptions and innovations and to tolerate a lot of dumb metal in the system. And the third uh, orthodoxy is that our work is too complex to automate. We think that the work to be done is complicated. It can't be automated. It requires lots of skill and years of training and lots of human intelligence to execute. Oil and gas is no place for robots. Only engineers can engineer, and only a geologist uh, alone can combine the art and science of interpretation. And there are plenty of other orthodoxies like this that, uh, that are part of our industry's lore, how we do things. Uh, things like transparency, competition versus cooperation, open source versus proprietary. Many of these orthodoxies are changing around the world. And if you just pause for a moment, I'm sure you can think of your own version or of an orthodoxy in the industry that makes you, causes you to think in certain ways and it may be time to think differently. So now what's so special about this round of technology change? Well, to understand the impact of the Internet of Things, which is the purpose of this conference, we do need to agree to terms. <clears throat> Despite the near universal use of the word digital uh, uh, to represent features of our modern economy and the research for my book, what I found was very hard to find a definition of digital that most people would agree with. To an engineer, for instance, digital might mean the opposite of analog. To a millennial, a digital is just how the world works. To a doctor, however, digital might be a rather awkward medical procedure involving some gloves, lubricant, and a moment of embarrassment. Well, here's my definition of digital. Something that's digital has to incorporate three building blocks. It has to incorporate what I call this holy trinity. Uh, it has to incorporate data, which is the lifeblood of, uh, of digital. A digital device, a solution, or a service has to produce and consume lots and lots of data. It has to have embedded analytics or some sort of computational ability to carry out computations or calculations on that data. And third, it needs connectivity. If it doesn't have connectivity through a telecommunications network, it's not able to exchange that data or its computations with other similar like devices within a, within a network. So connectivity is the third simple ingredient. Those of you with smartphones on your, uh, chair, in your hands, many of you do, you're typing away. Uh, those are all excellent examples of digital devices. Uh, your phone has its address book with its photographs and, and, of, uh, and uh, 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 information about your daily life, your calendar. It has analytics so it can calculate uh, the distance between two points in a map and connectivity because after all it's a phone and that's unfortunately probably the one use we don't actually use our phones for anymore is to actually making phone calls. But there's lots of examples of uh, these devices now uh, in the oil and gas industry. Here's just a handful. 
uh, tank gauges. Tank gauges are shrinking in size, cost, and power demand, but they're expanding in capability. I was uh, worked for uh, several years in Australia in the natural gas industry. All of those remote airports where those fly-in, fly-out doctors, if you watch them on the TV programs, fly-in and fly-out doctors go into these remote airports, how do you know there's fuel in the tank when you land your airplane there? Because if you land your airplane in one of these remote airports and there's no fuel, you can't take off again. So how do they do this? There's no telecommunications network. There's no cell phones out there. There's nothing. How do they do that? Internet of Things. Little in, in very, very efficient tank gauges in those, uh, in those tanks tell the fuel handlers exactly how much fuel is on, uh, available to them. Our vehicles. Next generation vehicles are going to be packed with digital smarts. You can watch it in the news. It's the, the, the cratering of the automotive industry today is being driven by the fact that so many new devices and digital technologies have to be put into cars. Porsche, for instance, is embedding blockchain in their next generation of sports cars. And of course, valves. With sensors and actuators following a cost, even very simple devices like valves uh, can generate their own data feed and tie into our supervisory systems. And it's the same for drill bits and flow measurement meters and devices, filters, motors, all the basic building blocks of process manufacturing. And of course, this digital trinity is based on the single foundational technology, the lowly computer chip. And as these uh, earlier generations of chips fall to practically zero because as manufacturers build new fab plants, the old fab plants stay running and they just generate chip after chip after chip. They basically now give them away. It's economically feasible to incorporate this technology into absolutely everything and to then to cram more capability onto them. They become smaller, thinner, lighter, safer, richer, and most critically, they need very little power to operate. And it's these chips that are storing all of the data, providing the analytics, and driving the network connections in our, our ever-connected world. So they, these three sisters, what I call the digital trinity, um, they're each experiencing their own massive levels of exponential growth. And it's very hard for our businesses to get our heads around exactly what exponential growth even means. Those of you who golf in the room, quick show of hands, anybody willing to admit they golf? A few, yeah. I bet you any one of you, if I said, could you point out and pick out the right club for a 30-yard shot down the fairway. Most of you, after a few, few rounds of golf, get pretty experienced to know reliably what club you'd use for your 30, rounds, your 30 yards. But if I said to you, pace out 30 exponential yards, could you do it? Most of us can visualize 30 yards linearly, but 30 exponential yards, it's 26 times around the world. So as these technologies iterate, 30 times. <clears throat> what we do is 30 changes in cycles or 30 kinds of improvement. In the digital world, they've advanced uh, tremendously. So where the oil and gas industry has worked in a world of constraint, again, one of its orthodoxies, digital is creating a world of abundance. Abundant data, abundant analytics, abundant networking. The volume of data we create is growing so dramatically it's hard to comprehend. IBM estimates that between 2015 and 2016, the world generated almost as much, 90% as much data in that time as it ever had been stored on any storage system up to that point. So a doubling just in almost two years. Unfortunately, most of it is pictures of cats, if you believe what you see on the internet. <laughs> a high quality photograph takes up eight to 10 megabytes of storage space. Most of us don't even discard our photos anymore. Once the phone gets full, you buy a new phone. You don't, you don't actually clean out your old photographs. We upgrade, not because the software is obsolete, but because we've run out of storage space. A high quality 10 minute video is one and a half gigabytes of storage. There are 400 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. Think about that, 400 hours every minute. A typical flight air, from Airbus or Boeing generates almost a terabyte of data. And when we get to automated cars and trucks, they will do the same sorts of things. Now, industrial data volumes are not growing at quite the same pace as consumer data, but that's just because we have yet to put as much of the devices that we need, purpose of this conference, onto all of the assets, people, and, and um, uh, uh, consumables that the industry uh, has. But as the industry's assets become data generators, they're going to match the prolific data generation of humans. Now beyond the growth in volume, data is changing shape. So one thing you notice, the early generations of computer systems could really only process rows and columns, very simple uh, structures, but in the form of numbers and letters and so forth. But modern data can take a lot of different shapes. 
It can be photographs, it can be waves, it can be sounds, it can be video, it can even be sensations like vibrations and smells. So the data is changing shape in addition to getting greater volume. One of our challenges, therefore, is going to be how do we interpret, understand, and visualize this enormous flood of data? Producing the data is only one part of the equation. How are we going to interpret it? The tools and techniques that have served us so well, um, analysis and interpretation, monitoring, are going to have to change to keep pace with the growth in data and volume. And as this data flows from one location to another, and it works to meet the analytic demands of its users. <clears throat> the spreadsheets of the past are simply not up to the task. Analytics and computational power are also exhibiting the same level of exponential growth as data. A smartphone has much the same performance and compute capacity as NASA's moonshot programs in the 60s. And in just 10 years, smartphones have gone from novelty to must have. This watch has the same horsepower as a 1990s crazed supercomputer. Lots of field workers, by the way, in oil and gas, are wandering around with smartphones in their pockets. Those are supercomputers. And what are we asking them to do with them? Certainly not program moonshots, of course, but many of them are spending a lot of time doing things with their phones that most of us would view as not suitable for work. The third sister of the digital trinity is connectivity. And without connectivity, a device that has no connectivity is not much better than a calculator, or not even a very good calculator. Low-cost chips, analytics, and software development have transformed telecom uh, sector in just one human lifetime. The world is now so highly interconnected. The number of households globally with internet service is around 55% compared to 80% that have access to electricity. Think about that. It's taken us 100 years to get the electrical system spread out to just 80% of the population. But just in the space of 10 years, 55% of the, of the world's population has access to the internet. Think about that. Internet, more important than electricity in the lives of many people. The number of individual internet users is three and a half billion. The number of mobile phone subscriptions worldwide, so this is devices that can actually talk to, to uh, the internet, of ser internet services, a measure of uh, access is now at 7.7 .7 billion mobile phones. The number of inanimate objects, again, Internet of Things, how do we get these devices onto the network, is uh, 8 to 10 billion and expected to grow to 30 to 40 billion by 2030. The volume of data moved on these networks gives you a good indication as to uh, just the, the pace of growth. In 1974, the global telecommunications industry, the whole industry around the world, would move a terabyte of data per month across the big cross-industry uh, cross uh, telecommunications networks. We now move one terabyte every second. That's a growth rate of two and a half million times, by the way. It's a huge growth rate. So the trajectory, therefore, is very clear. Smaller, cheaper, more capacity, lower power, encrypted, connected. What was constrained is now abundant. What was prohibitively expensive is now effectively free. What was privileged and elite is now common and democratic. What was novel and risky is now embedded and background. That's five more orthodoxies. They're just no longer valid. Yogi Berra once said, making predictions is difficult, especially about the future. Let me share with you a sense as to how this future internet world might play out. This is a little chart that I use to try and explain some of my, well, some of my ideas and some of my thinking. At the heart of the, <clears throat> the change that we're living in is a story about data. You might be thinking that uh, the Death Star is, is uh, urinating on R2-D2, but that's just a, I have to draw all of the artwork myself because um, unfortunately I don't have a team, uh, so um, it was a poor, a poor rendition. But anyway, the at the heart of this is a story about data generating, analyzing, consuming, managing, and presenting data. Winning at digital, winning in oil and gas, will mean winning at data. Data needs to be reviewed, viewed now in oil and gas as a true corporate resource on par with other assets. Data management needs greater attention. Data talent needs to be recruited. And accountability for data in oil and gas needs to be strengthened. Next is the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is going to generate that, all of that data. That's where it will originate. The sensors will generate that data in greater diversity of form and content. 
Uh, there'll be uh, devices will appear on virtually everything you can think of simply because the cost profile is so low. Pumps, valves, vessels, vehicles, people. Oil and gas as an asset intense industry will drive, which drives demand for internet connected things, will be one of the biggest and greatest adopters of this technology. The tolerances though will have to tighten and data and measurement standards are going to have to improve. The, 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 the variance that we tolerate today in data measurement won't work effectively in a more digital uh, world. As I mentioned, It'll take artificial intelligence to interpret all of that data. This is uh, my pump jack being monitored by all kinds of uh, dev digital devices. Um, only the modern tools of machine learning and artificial intelligence are going to be able to process the immense volumes of information. Yesterday's technologies are not up to the task. AI will drive the demand for artificial and cell, uh, data science professionals, and it's a key reason why universities and training schools all around North America are struggling to revamp their training programs to incorporate more emphasis on the data professions as part of their curriculum. The amount of money pouring into um, AI, coupled with the phenomenon of fleet learning, individual AI engines that share with each other exactly what they've learned, the instant they've learned it, point to constantly falling cost and constantly improving capability. Eventually, job design is going to start with AI. How would an artificial intelligence engine do this job? And then we will figure out the human attributes around it. Today, we do it the exact opposite way. We build the job for a human, and then we try and figure out how AI can change it. Another orthodoxy that is poised to change. Next, robots are going to apply um, this data and do the work. The, the robots in t uh, have to consume enormous amounts of this AI uh, data. Heavy haulers in the oil sands are just the first and most visible examples. Um, onboard cameras and sensors that feed uh, data about uh, truck um, operations um, uh, to uh, the real world and all of its hazards. Uh, and the hauler, of course, will then start, move, stop, and change direction and so forth. For the moment, there may be a human controller uh, manipulating these machines. But in time, even that task, you can see, may become unnecessary. Industrial machines will have onboard AI capabilities through which they will make increasingly smart decisions. And these decisions might include, given a set of conditions, when to run, at what pace, uh, at what cost structure, and using what resources. Today, only humans can make those kinds of decisions if we choose to make them at all. Where are we going to put all of this data? Cloud computing. It's the logical place. It's fast, it's secure, it's easy to deploy, and it can ramp up and ramp down very, very easily. Don't be surprised if Google and Amazon start coming into, artificial, uh, into interpretation of geologic data. Uh, there was a use case in Europe of a global super major who surrendered a chunk of their seismic information to the cloud computing companies to see in a competition whether or not cloud was up to the task. This was two years ago. And their conclusion was yes, cloud computing can do as good a job in housing and interpreting uh, the uh, subsurface data that oil and gas has always maintained needed to be held in-house, an orthodoxy that broke. All those uh, sensors, of course, they'll need occasional or quite frequent patches to deal with viruses. Uh, and the only practical and cost-effective way, once you get to 30 billion sensors out there, to keep them current and clean is to tie them into cloud computing to deploy uh, that, uh, the security of patches. This <clears throat> uh, SCADA business model that we're used to with its lock-in, no, no ability to upgrade, uh, that, that particular model looks like it may be at the edge of its life, or it will certainly need to change in order to accommodate these coming changes. The traditional software deployment business model, I send you CDs, is now effectively gone. When was the last time any of you bought software and it came on a CD? It's all going to the cloud. No software vendor in the right mind would continue down that model. It's all moving to this new technology. How are we going to trust all of these devices? Well, that's the role of blockchain. The rapid growth will drive the need for a new trust mechanism, that trust mechanism which is not human-centric. And blockchain will be the technology that provides it because it gives us that immutable evidence that an event took place, that a device acted, that the data was correct. By assuring trust down the road, blockchain will give agency to robots. Think about that agency to robots. Today, our robots don't have agency. They don't act of their own. But under a blockchain world with artificial intelligence, that's possible. Blockchain will open up entirely new business models, such as asset sharing. 
Instead of a business needing to own the asset, it can subscribe to the asset. You can already subscribe to a robot fueled by AI in the cloud to interpret data and pay for it using a blockchain transaction. That's already available. Where does ERP fit? <clears throat> well, the 70s called, they want their ERP back. The ERP model of the 70s is not going to survive either. And that's why the SAP, Oracle, and the other major technology vendors are furiously rewriting their technology for a digital world, using in-memory computing, embedding blockchain inside this technology, deploying artificial intelligence deep, deep within. ERP is always going to be a critical part of the future, certainly for the next um, uh, many, many years until we retrofit many of the business processes uh, that um, uh, underpin uh, how ERP engines uh, operate. But you can see it on the horizon. Imagine a compressor that uses its own onboard AI capabilities to decide which power source to use. Because power sources may vary. Renewable power may be cheaper than battery power, which might be cheaper than fossil fuel power at any given moment. That engine will decide what power to use, when to run, contract for that power, and then pay for it as a single transaction. Agile. How we work needs to change. Agile methods is how digital gets done. Digital innovation is going to require whole new ways of getting things built and deployed. If there's a reason why AI pro projects may struggle for adoption, it's because the business process of coping with change inside oil and gas companies themselves need faster ways of getting things built and deployed. The logic of separating an IT function and an operating technology function, a SCADA team, may disappear. And last but not least, and at the top of my model is people. It's people who will manage change. The talent models of the past need to change too. The models of hiring individuals for deep disciplinary skills uh, will always have a requirement for that, but the, those roles are now going to have to incorporate more capability and attention to helping uh, cope with uh, digital innovation, data, artificial intelligence, and these other, other technologies. Now, to realize this future, we need to therefore free our thinking. And let me propose for the industry to consider three, at a minimum, orthodoxies to, de to, to replace the orthodoxies of the past. Number one, let's set our data free. We need to think differently about data. If it wants to be free, set it free. The dozens of creative digital startups blossoming in Calgary and many oil and gas centers around the world are abundant with capability and talent and creativity, but thoroughly starved of data. They don't have the data to work with. Our industry, though, is abundant with data, but we're short of the digital know-how. Combined, we can unlock that next wave of digital innovation. We need to accord value to data so that it starts to attract capital. We need to champion data so that the market recognizes what oil and gas already knows. We are as data intense as Facebook but without the risk of Jeff Bezos' private parts intruding on our, pri our private worlds. We need to free our data from the bondage of what I call human uh, interpretation and let the machines take over. Second, orthodoxy. Dumb metal is now the expensive metal. We need to recognize that dumb metal, which requires human overlords, supervisors, and maintainers, is the expensive metal. Metal that's trapped in a walled garden and can only speak one language, one SCADA language should be treated like a newly discovered tribe in the banks of the Amazon in Brazil, the subject of scientific inquiry. But please, avoid contact to avoid contamination. The colliery to that expensive dumb metal is cheap smart metal. We need to be designing from the start, from the perspective that metal can be made smart, and it needs to stay smart over time. Smart metal, the internet of things, must be the minimum mandatory, not the nice to have. And finally, we need to the orthodoxy that work is too costly not to automate. South of the border, our US peers and competitors are fundamentally rethinking work. Instead of 10 and 15% per performance improvements for digital, they're aiming for 75 to 90% improvements because that's what they've seen happen to many of their other industries south of the border. And if they didn't have enough blessings from their copious quantities of shale deposits, the Americans have discovered that entire oil production fields may be better managed by machines and artificial intelligence, provided those fields are highly bejeweled with the Internet of Things. If we let go of these orthodoxies and free ourselves to embrace some new ones, if we move quickly to adopt digital innovations in the industry, if we open our minds to the opportunities presented, we can keep the industry moving forward for many years. And as I've set out, the Internet of Things is utterly central to achieving this vision. 
And with that, I wish you all a very good conference, and we can open for questions. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find more episodes of Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts, or just visit jeffreycan.com slash podcast for more. If you have a minute, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell other people about the show. This helps them discover more great content. Later this year, Jeffrey will publish a book on the impacts of digital innovation on the oil and gas industry. You can keep track of this new project by following Jeffrey on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil & Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.